We have to do an introduction and shit. You can't just start talking about the goddamn book. You are the one who wants okay. this to be a podcast. <laughs> okay. we're, gonna, we're trying to get syndicated or whatever the fuck they call it for a podcast. Uh, hi, folks. This is the Ankmore Pork Historians Guild. Um, we are here with you today uh, talking about Guards Guards. Um, I, my name is Mulch, and I use they, them pronouns. My name is Chio, and I use she or her pronouns. My name is Pertis, and I use they, them pronouns. Okay, now you can talk about the book. Now that we've introduced ourselves, you yeah. can talk about the book. This is how we get <laughs> <laughs> This is how we get syndicated. oh boy so it is genuinely astonishing reading guards guards and marveling at how perfect it is and also knowing that it's not the best night watch book you mean the best watch like that's so exciting to me yeah yeah it's city Uh, watch whatever i don't i those subcategories are fake anyway I see. Well, Night Watch is another book, and The Watch is The Watch yeah. as a whole. I know, Mulch. I am aware of Night Watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, Making night moves. I wanted to start by saying this is the first time that listening to it as an audiobook actually I feel, felt made the experience better overall. Yeah. In general, the, the voices. I am a reader, yeah. I the voices it. in the audiobook were great this time. I especially love Sybil's Sybil's voice in it. Um, and, but and I just love Silbo. Sib, Silbo. I love Sybil in general. So. Silbo, my I think love. this is also, like... But yeah, for me, what, what really made the difference... Be gay and do crimes. What really made the difference... <laughs> Sorry. You can't... What really made the difference for me is that um, Nigel Planer gave... Vimes a kind of nasally weak voice which really helped me because that's who he is right now um Mm -hmm. i think if i had read the book i would have imagined him as sam vimes the absolute fucking legend that he is and someone who i have already watched grow up Mm -hmm. essentially But in this book, he's a fucking drunkard, and he's not a hero, and he barely does anything that could be considered heroic, um, except out of pure stupidity. He isn't the Grand Vimes yet, the world-renowned policeman uh, and arbiter of law. He's just a fucking drunkard who doesn't like anything. (laughs) So, I love his like nasally head cold sounding voice. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is partially because um I Nigel Planer's readings of these books was my introduction to the Night Watch. I mean to the City Watch books. <laughs> I always hear his voice as the characters. Yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. I, I don't at all. <laughs> um Yeah, and see the the fun thing about the watch is the at least for me, the later books are voiced by somebody else. And some of the voices I like better, but a lot of them I like I don't like as much than Nigel Planer's voice voices. I'm trying um, to remember what the other guy's name is, but his uh Nobby Knobs is Is Simon something? I don't like his Nobby Knobs. The other guy's Nobby Knobs. It's absolutely I disgusting not, and it's perfect. I could not <laughs> I I couldn't get over. I didn't. I didn't like his knobby knobs. It's like th- that's the one where like his voice is really deep, right? Yeah, um, deep. But I don't know. He feels sickly. His his pronunciation uh-huh. is incredible. I did. That that's fair. That's fair. I I personally, it was probably just because I already had the image of his voice in my head. Um, but I did like his carrot better because carrot sounds like a dwarf with the other voice actor Mm. um which was interesting to me like oh yeah i remember yeah he did um he did the fifth elephant right the other guy i think so yeah 
I think that was the other guy by the fifth elephant. Um, so it is really interesting to compare them, but I think Nigel Planer was perfect for this book. Yeah, he was. And I don't know if I said his name right, but yeah. Uh, and like, I thought his Sybil Ramkin. His Sybil Ramkin. What? What? The other one that really got me is his um, his just normal dude's voice. He gave them all uh, Northerners accents. Uh huh. And it like. Really Stephen fucking, Briggs really fucking was, for me. Is the other guy. <laughs> Props to Stephen Briggs. Promise not to talk too much shit about you, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did the voices for Monstrous Regiment, where, which is where I recognized his Monstrous Regiment and the Moist von Lipwig books. Lipwig, which is where uh-huh. I got introduced to his knobby knobs and shit. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he gave them all Northerners voices. I really and like. I think it was like really, really top notch. Not something I would have been able to do very well. It's hard in America sometimes to, to, to read these books because we don't have like. Nah, this is like hardcore. The poor person's accent. They look exactly yeah. the same. These people look exactly the same, but they have the poor person's accent. Yeah. 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 Because Britain is a bad place to live. Yes. Let that never be. <laughs> let that never be forgotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got to say, I, like Terry Pratchett is very good at reminding you that Britain is, in many ways, not a great place to live. Yes, he does a very yeah. good job of that. Yeah, which makes his book readable because God, the British authors who are like, it's wonderful. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, it's not. He writes. Yeah about place in a way that is very familiar with me I mean to me because it's a combination of uh I'd say like it's very loving and he very clearly loves Britain but at the same time it's frustration and there's also frustration and anger and just the acknowledgement that it's a disgusting place. <laughs> like you can love so- love somewhere and just know that is it's an absolute cesspit. You know, it's like those broken birds mulch picks up or whatever. You're like, this is disgusting. I mean, this we live in America. This thing should. We are very exist. aware of this. <laughs> it's ungodly. The broken, the broken birds I pick up. What does that even mean? I didn't, I didn't want to go into depth about your mammal adventures, so I chose an animal that was not one of the horrid mammals. Oh, I see. I've never had them. a bird before. You love them, I but you recognize that they're uh, just absolutely broken and shouldn't exist. <laughs> oh, we're talking about silver bells, I see. <laughs> um, you know, actually, I wasn't thinking about silver bells in this interest, but um, that you picked out a different animal than I picked out. <laughs> Kind of proves the fucking point. <laughs> okay, let's let's. Uh, let's Silver Bell is very um, good boy she, Bindle. Yes, she is. What, what's Snatch that dragon's the, name? What? Errol. Let me find it. Errol. Errol. It's Errol. Errol. That's. Was I his... mean, his real name. His real I name. See. Good boy. Better. Good boy, Bindle Featherstone of Quirm. Yeah. Um, Silverbells is my cat, and she's immortal and will never die um, and lives her life as a, a Etheridge abomination. Yeah. Do you, do you know the curse of Cain from like the cryptid. Bible? <laughs> the what? Curse of, do you know the curse <laughs> of Cain from the Bible? That's what Silverbells has. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> she must have committed some crime. I can only assume that she is the first cat to kill another cat. God, I, cat other cats have killed other cats. <laughs> yes, oh, but she was, just the first the, one. she was the first one. She was the first one. I see. Okay, uh, back to the book. Um, <laughs> this book was so the most easily enjoyable book out of any of the ones we've read. In my opinion, like it's yes, still rated I below uh, Weird Sisters for me because Weird Sisters like affected me in a profound way. Um, but it is definitely the most easily enjoyable 
out of any of them. Yeah, this is the first time where I felt that the books didn't have like some kind of major misstep that made me furious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like there were parts that I wasn't enjoying as much, but there's a, such a huge leap, a huge difference between, oh, I didn't enjoy this as much and what the fuck are you thinking, dude? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and there wasn't a moment like that. I didn't really get a moment this time where I was like, yeah. Jesus, dude, don't do like, that. <laughs> I, it's like, I found some of the dragon stuff, like the, the descriptions of the dragon stuff and the like, uh, secret society stuff. I found some of that kind of boring. Uh, it wasn't, I it wasn't what the fuck. I disagree with the dragon it stuff. It wasn't, wasn't what the fuck. Like the, I mean, not the not the dr- real dragon stuff. I just meant the like the description of how they exist, and like in the other, s- s- like, like I fact- said, I strongly yeah. disagree. I love that stuff. Uh-huh. Like to me, that kind of almost gets to the core of what the book is about. Mm-hmm. What what is the book about? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Run with it. <laughs> well, I was going to ease into it by uh, talking about how Harry... I mean, Terry Pratchett is a human... Is a deeply humanistic person. Mm-hmm. And how he clearly loves people. But everybody who loves humans and believes in humans' ability to do good runs into an issue which is um, the fact that humans are kind of awful a lot of the time, often, and do a lot of fucked up shit very casually. It's kind of like Britain. Humans Um, are kind of like Britain. They do a lot of bad shit casually. Yes, or in this case... (laughs) (laughs) Or in this this book specifically, um, there are continuous comparisons made between human fallibility and the fallibility of the swamp dragons and the way that um, swamp dragons are built. Mm -hmm. And then there's the contrast of the big dragon, Draco Nobilis. And um, the way... Let's see if I can... Let me pull up the quote at the very end. It's so good, and I love it so much. Are you going to talk about the banality of evil one? I was going to also talk about that one, but I wanted to specifically talk about... Fuck, draw... where the fuck are my notes? Here we are. Oh, man. Veterinary's um, opinions on humanity are... Yeah. Sorry, go on. It's not that bit either, but I love that one as well. Mm-hmm. Of course you do. Here we, here we are. Um, it's where the librarian hands Vimes the uh, summoning of Dragon and pulls out a section and urges him to read it. Mm-hmm. And this is the section. Section. Um, Yet dragons are naughty like in unicorns, I will in. They dwelleth, and no, I'm not doing the old English accent. You can't make me. <laughs> Coward. In but some realm defined <laughs> defined by the fancy of the willy, and thus it might be that whomsoever calleth upon them and giveth them their pathway unto this world, calleth their own dragon of the mind. Mm-hmm. And here's drag here's uh Vime's uh kind of interpretation of this. A realm of fancy, Vime's thought. That's where they went, then, into our imaginations, and when we call them back, we shape them, like squeezing dough into pastry shapes. Only you don't get gingerbread men. You get what you are, your own darkness given shape. Yeah. And then he turns to the librarian, and he sa- and he asks, what kind of man, man was Demelikite? Particularly holy, said Vimes. The ape shook his head. Well, noticeably evil, then? The ape shrugged and shook his head again. If I were you, said Vimes, I'd put that book somewhere safe and the book of law with it. They're too bloody dangerous. Yeah. I love that bit. To me, mm-hmm. that is the most perfect interpretation of dragons imaginable. Yeah, I, th- I think it was I think uh, it was really good. I think that it was a, a cool. So. Vi- er, 
so in the lead up to this patrician um the patrician has this like little speech about the banality of evil and and it's really it's really fascinatingly i love i love how he negates it um just just vibes being like you get the fuck out of bed for that shit man (laughs) you think everybody's evil and you still get the fuck out of bed and really? the is like, yeah, yeah, I do. I think yeah. that it's it's a really fantastic negation, both the end of the banality of evil and the the presence of of original sin concepts, and um, both. Would of you those like me to parts. read the sections out loud? Both of those two. I mean, you can if you like, <laughs> or I could read it. Because I've got it. I've so got to pull up. I've got to pull that. Um, I, I specifically want to talk about the people who will follow any dragon, worship any god, ignore any iniquity. Bit that's so good. Let me let me read it and then we'll then we'll talk about it. Then let me give you yeah. some advice, Captain. He said, "Yes, sir. It may help you make some sense of the world, sir." I believe you find life such a problem because you think that there are good people and the bad people, said the man. You're wrong, of course. There are, always and only, the bad people, but some of them are on opposite sides. He waved his thin hand towards the city and walked over to the window. A great rolling sea of evil, he said, almost proprietarily. Shallower in some places, of course, but deeper, oh, so much deeper in others. But people like you put together little rafts of rules and vaguely good intentions and say, this is the opposite. This will triumph in the end. Amazing. He slapped Vimes good-naturedly on the back. Down there, he said, are people who will follow any dragon, Worship any god, ignore any iniquity, all out of a kind of humdrum everyday badness, not the really high creative loathsomeness of the great sinners, but a sort of mass-produced darkness of the soul. Sin, you might say, without a trace of originality. They accept evil not because they say yes, but because they don't say no. I'm sorry if this offends you, he added, patting the captain's shoulder, but you fellows really need us. Yes, sir, said Vimes quietly. Oh, yes, we're the only ones who know how to make things work. You see, the only thing the good people are good at is overthrowing the bad people, and you're good at that, I'll grant you, but the trouble is that it's the only thing you're good at. One day it's the ringing of the bells and the casting down of the evil tyrant, and the next it's everyone sitting around complaining that ever since the tyrant was overthrown, no one's been taken out the trash. Because the bad people know how to plan, it's part of the specification, you might say. Every evil tyrant has a plan to rule the world. The good people don't seem to have the knack. Maybe, but you're wrong about the rest, said Vimes. It's just because people are afraid and alone. He paused. It sounded pretty hollow, even to him. He shrugged. They're just people, he said. They're just doing what people do, sir. Lord Vetinari gave him a friendly smile. Of course, of course, he said. You have to believe that. I I appreciate Otherwise, you'd go quite mad. Otherwise, you'd think you're standing on a feather-thin bridge over the vaults of hell. Otherwise, existence would be a dark agony, and the only hope would be that there is no life after death. I quite understand. He looked at his desk and sighed. And now, he said, there's such a lot to do. I'm afraid poor Wants was a good servant, but an inefficient master. So you may go. Have a good night's sleep. Oh, and do bring your men in tomorrow. The city must show its gratitude. And then they have some bullshit. (laughs) 
After a while, he made a few pencil annotations to the paper in front of him and looked up. I said, he said, that you may go. Vimes paused at the door. Do you believe all that, sir? He said, about the endless evil and the sheer blackness. Indeed, indeed, said the patrician, turning over the page. It is the only logical conclusion. But you get out of bed every morning, sir? Hm? Yes, what is your point? I'd just like to know why, sir. Oh, do go away, Vimes. There's a good fellow. And that is, like, directly in the lead-up to the earlier quote that we did before. Right after this, the librarian comes up to him and shows him that yeah. dragon's part of the book. Yeah. I, that is one of my favorite scenes in the entire book. Hmm, your audio Possibly one of my this. favorite scenes in the entire series. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Chio, your audio quality just went way and down. Curtis, you have gotten real... Oh, fuck. Uh, what about now? Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's a really, that's, that's a really interesting scene. And like, it is, and it really does get to the core of a lot of, uh, Terry Pratchett's views on mob mentality and like, how, yeah, how people work, I guess in groups um and it, and it is it's like really interesting i think it sort of i think it kind of articulates an ongoing conflict inside of a lot of terry pratchett's work mm -hmm. where there's like it's sort of interesting because there is this um very articulate very wordy explanation of like why people are bad and do and sort of the nature of the of ordinary badness mm -hmm. and then there's the basic retort of well that's just how people are they're they're scared and they're alone and they're trying their best yeah and that really is and i find that very interesting yeah, and that really is so much of Terry Pratchett's book because books because Terry Pratchett is wonderful at very human characterization and acknowledges both that people are genuinely just trying their best best and that there is this cultural everyday evil that, that like like some of what Federnari says is really shown in Terry Pratchett's books that i mean just culturally there are so much is messed up and like that is shown in terry practice books along with the every like everyday kindness and everyday evil are shown in terry practice books and it's very interesting how those yes. are both explored and like that is why his books are so human like one of the reasons, it really, yeah. Yeah, I think that the patrician and, and Sam, I think... Sam Vimes playing against each other is one of the most enduring and iconic relationships in the watch or in any of his books because of this exact push and pull. They are both fundamentally humanists. Yes, they both fundamentally believe that people fall into their own strength and control in some regards their own worlds. But while Sam Vimes believes that people are uncontrolled and thus, like, are mostly uncontrolled but, like, want to do good, and, like, the patrician thinks they're mostly uncontrolled but desire to do evil, to do gain. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's this fantastic dichotomy between yeah. that comes up over and over and over in the watch game books and is explored over and over and over again and this book is such a wonderful marker of the beginning of that philosophical struggle that would continue for both terry pratchett and sam vimes and the patrician for the yeah. rest of his life till the yes. very end and it's also 
Yes. And it's also um, the beginning of Terry Pratchett writing books about cities and how they work. Because this is this is um, a city watch book, but it is, I think, more than it is about any single character. It is about people and how people interact and how basically the city as itself itself runs and what it does when um, faced with uh, and how it responds to ca- catastrophe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think this is one of the first books where the where... city watch is really. You can do. Um, sorry, the city watch, like, along with it, uh, his Moist von Lipwick books, um, and many of his other, uh, and many of Terry Pratchett's other books, uh, we'll talk about them when they come up. Um, it talks about the city watch are just a representative of us of the city where they're individuals. Yeah. But like they're a lens through which the city is viewed and they kind of represent like civic bodies as a whole where they're underpaid, underfunded and not respected at all. Um, But in their own way, they are doing a vital duty. Mm -hmm. And these would be... And doing something vital to the running and maintenance of the city. Yeah. And and absolutely, as time goes on, those would become some of his most common heroes. Normal people who do some normal job that is vital to our society, but gets no respect. And in those stories, those heroes win over the whole world. I mean, Moise von Lipwig... The big is the um, the highest. It's about the postal stature. services, yeah. and banks, and 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 stamp collectors, and he calls in gods to do that story. You know, yeah, that is mm-hmm. that is the type of belief that Terry Pratchett has, and this is the first time in a book that we get to see it. And what I was going to say earlier is that I also feel like this is the first book where he does something that we see him do a lot later in his career, which is even at a fucking climax, at a major moment in a book, he will stop and listen to some fucking randos on the street. I mean, just <laughs> motherfuckers. There is well, a, there's this fantastic scene, and, it, and it's, I think, such a shining example of this. Where uh, he stands and looks at a poster for the capture of the dragon. Uh, and and it's just these, like, three guys talking about the rate for it and, like, what they need to catch a dragon and all this. And it's it's perfect. It's, it's absolutely out of the blue. I mean, Vimes is literally walking from one point in the story to another major point in the story. And he just stops. For no discernible reason and listens to these dudes for like a kind of a while, you know, in, in book time. Yeah. yeah. And it's and it's a great scene. Phenomenal. And it and it does <laughs> and it does kind of tie together both old Terry Pratchett and new Terry Pratchett. Because that could have been a scene out of the color of magic. Like that is very old school sort of uh swords and sword sorcery fantasy parody. Yeah, I mean, it could have been out of the color of magic if the color of magic was better. Yeah, I was about to say that was not a good book, and and no. you're saying it, and you're saying it's no, the I old mean, school Terry Pratchett, but we are still in the old school Terry Pratchett. I mean, so many parts of this, he's starting to imagine. Right, you can see it. He's starting to imagine Ankh Morpork for the first time as like a actually living and working and orderly city. He starts in pyramids. He gets the idea of the Assassins Guild and how it works. Or he doesn't get the idea, but he starts laying down, like, why why or how could the Assassin's Guild actually function? Like, how could a city have this in it and justify it? I have to justify that. I have to explain what I meant. And and this is really where he starts to do that over and over and over again, I feel like. And it's what makes these books so phenomenal, because... It's no longer just these little jokes because it felt like so much of his other work was that little 
Oh, yeah, yeah, there's an assassin guild. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a thieves guild. Because, of course, a city that's sufficiently advanced would do a thieves guild as long as they were warped minded enough. But now he's justifying them, right? Now we're we're at the the point where he's like, yeah, there's a thieves guild because they can do a better job capturing thieves and they work like this and they pay dues like this and it's good for the city like this. And we get to judge for ourselves whether that's still right. Yeah. I got to say, Curtis, you and I have mentally, have like mentally sorted uh, Terry Pratchett's body of work differently. Um, Where mentally, I have like the first section of Terry Pratchett's writing, which is the color of magic through um, sorcery. And then I have like the middle section of Terry Pratchett's work, which is the bulk of his career and is roughly um, Weird Sisters onto from Weird Sisters onto uh, sorry, just give me a sec to bring up the Wikipedia page. I mean, I would definitely categorize this as a d- definitely a different era than those er- earlier books. Or an error of quality of writing. Um, yeah. And cool. I would count it as starting with uh, Weird Sisters, because that's when his... That's when he became a good writer. <laughs> I, but, wait, wasn't Sorcery I would sorcery disagree. After? I would consider... Um, sorcery no, Sorcery came sisters. out before. Okay, we okay. Just this. <laughs> I I just... For, I just... Yeah, for, so. for me, there are three parts to his work, but they start at very different points. For me, mm-hmm. it's color yeah. magic all the way up to fucking Lords and Ladies is his early work. In that early work, mm-hmm. he's still introducing those basic ideas. He's still working out what the fuck they are, at the very least up until Small Gods, because I think that Small Gods is a major turning point in his work and in his conceptions mm-hmm. of the Discworld as a whole. Then you've got... To me, you know, that just seems like a really random way to sort Terry no, Pratchett's Well, let me work. finish no, fucking explaining that. instead of that. interrupting me. <laughs> and then we... <laughs> and maybe it'll fucking make sense. And then we've got, you know, Men at Arms all the way up to, um, to me, probably Monstrous Regiment or Hat Full of Sky. This, to me, is where he's fleshing out and justifying so many of these ideas, you know? You get phenomenal works like The Truth, Hogfather, Feet of Clay, which all extend out what Ankh Morpork is, what the gods are, what it means to be cosmically unbalanced. Uh, you get the watch really becomes the watch, the the strong men that they are, and the new organization with Vimes as a like reborn man after... He's still being introduced in those early books. Um, And then you have the works after he knows he's going to die. After he's, he's learned that, that he's finished and like any day now (laughs) he might not be able to write anymore. You know, that's, that's going postal. That's, that's, that's really where that starts for me. Um, he he knows he's going to die um and he starts writing kind of with that intention to me um uh, he starts doing doing really incredible work he he starts giving vimes a life to go back to that's more than just his job and and more than just i mean more than just the case because, you know, you get incredible works like Thud, where the only thing that matters to Vimes anymore, it's not the work, it's not good or bad, it's just reading a story to his kid. You get works like Making Money, where, you know, there are major flaws, but Litvig is just trying to make something work and, and just trying to live a peaceful, happy life at this point in so much as he can with his strange and broken ways. I, I think that that is a major turning point for me. That's why the, those three sections are differentiated for me, and and how I read them. Okay. All my life. 
Yeah. I, okay. That, that makes sense to me. And I think I, we're um, definitely, like, there is, there's I, two ways I to look say, at it, which is. You did cut me off before I finished explaining what my sections oh. were. So I will note that. Sorry. <laughs> For me, it's like the first section is the color of magic through sorcery, which is where I guess sort of like an experimental period where he's still trying to figure out what Discworld is. Um, I suppose I could subdivide it into like the color of magic and the light fantastic and then equal rights onwards. But to me, like that's one big section. And then there's a really, really big section, which is basically um, Weird Sisters through Amazing Maurice and his Educated Rodents, um, which is where he he's writing novels that I consider to be quintessentially Terry Pratchett, um, because they have that sort of very neat, very tidy structure, um, whereas the story so perfectly constructed um like i don't like them all equally and i don't think they're all equally good but there's a very real sense of um structure to them they're very tidy for the most part and then um there's the night watch on onward um, which is where he starts writing sort of more, um, a lot more sober and a lot more dramatic stories. And there's a distinct shift in tone. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, the final section uh, for me is purely, in a way, I think of it as being almost a subsection of the Night Watch section. Um, where there's a shift in his prose writing and in his the way he writes dialogue that is very noticeable and very obtrusive. Uh, there's glimpses of it every now and then in Unseen Academicals, but I Shall Wear Midnight onwards. His books are absolutely choked with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are my sections. Yeah. Uh, they're really, they're not very meta. They're very much just rooted in how I observe his writing to be, what I observe his writing to be like in those books. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like, that's, that is def. I think those are both really legitimate ways to look at his writing. Like, th those are... Um, it's it's like they're they're just different categories like how i've been thinking about the early books is that his skill level is climbing um but there will you know there's a point after that after he becomes a sta established writer that that's not as relevant anymore he's not going to keep getting better with every single book like he he you know really grows into his own style and his own like quality of writing and that's pretty i think that there's a point where it's just book book to book whether or not instead of this climb we've been seeing with from um color of magic to the guards guards like um but it it there is a point where it just changes um significantly but it, it's not like the the categories i've been thinking of it aren't going to be relevant um within like a few books so that is that's mm. um, like to me the leap between sorcery and weird sisters is just radical mm -hmm. like i i don't even know how to describe it it's you get sorcery which is kind of um it's very messy and it has this sort of it kind of feels like a bunch of sketches crammed within a, a loose larger structure mm -hmm. and then you get Weird Sister which is so carefully written and constructed mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Where it's still got like comedic bits in it, but they're all tied within this tight. Um, it just ticks, a, ticks along like a clock. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, he definitely and that, improves. In I think that structure never really leaves. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that's just a matter of perspective. And what, I, and what I meant about the uh, bit with the uh, heroes looking at the uh, dragon sign being like a bit of old Pratchett is to me that it would read very differently if it were inside of the color of magic, but I think that could be a bit inside of the color of magic. It just wouldn't have the same meaning or mm -hmm. thematic purpose that it doesn't guards guards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Absolutely. Y'all, I love this fucking book. It was really good. I I love he's continuing this theme. I mean, this is really what he explores during this period, super duper intensely. But this theme of the story subverting itself by doing itself. Um, that's that's what the entirety of Carrot's character is, <laughs> and a character that he's stuck around with forever. That Carrot actually is the king. That the story is succeeding itself. Or is subverting itself just by doing exactly what it says it's going to do right at the fucking beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you just made a lot mm -hmm. of assumptions on the middle parts. Yeah. Um, I love that theme and I love how how much he he delves into it in this one without being so heavy handed as in his previous books. Um, not to say that those the presentation of that idea was bad in those ones. Merely to say that, like, he he doesn't just be like, yeah, no, Karen's the king, and he decides not to. He, he will later. But he doesn't in <laughs> this one. Carrot is the rightful heir, does have a magic sword, but it's not like he has, like, this, like, phenomenal moment where everyone's like, oh, fuck, for sure this dude's the king, he should be the king, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's just this, like quiet realization of like oh that prophecy did happen and we as readers got to kind of know it the whole time and kind of like expect it like <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. kind of want to have this moment where that destiny is fulfilled and it just doesn't happen not that yeah. way not in the way that we imagined it and i love that i mm -hmm. i thought it was i mean well they done. do kind of like at the introduction of Carrot, they do kind of tell you he's king, um, but they do so, but he does so in such a way that during the middle structure, you kind of forget it. Mm -hmm. Where like his in introduction comes immediately after the sort of, um, after the summoning of the dragon and th the guys uh, talk about and articulate what the legend of the king coming to save ink more pork in its time of need is mm -hmm. yeah and then that's you, how you know uh, yeah i was about to say I, I feel like we as readers are supposed to know the entire time that he's the king oh yeah, yeah. okay yeah um man i do have a, it, it's also it's not a magical sword it's a non-magical sword yes. it's very unusual <laughs> yeah uh, it is magical in that <laughs> its nature is completely and entirely unmagical. Which yeah. Is phenomenal. Um, I do have a very important question. Um, does Carrot have a beard? I need to know. I don't think they say whether or not Carrot has a beard. He, they do not ever say whether or not Carrot has a beard. I and the thing is... personally have always imagined him as completely clean-shaven. And and that's the thing is that's so the natural that's the natural image that comes up in your head. But the thing is, he is a dwarf. He's established as a dwarf, and in later books, continues to be established as a dwarf. And it would be weird of him not to have a beard. He, it's never said whether or not he has a beard, which it would be weird to not mention that he has a beard in his description. Um, but it would be weird as him as a dwarf to not have a beard. 
I, I, I think he doesn't because I think he Here's makes him more of a fact fish about out Karen. of water. I mean, that's fair, but like he no might other literally... dwarf. He's he's referred to as a dwarf by other dwarfs. He's accepted, uh, you know, as you know, more progressive dwarfs accept him as a dwarf. It is never mentioned that it's weird that he doesn't have a beard. Here's the thing about Carrot. A fun fact a fun fact that totally blew my mind. In Guards Guards, he may be literally too young to be able to grow a proper beard. Oh he is God. 15 years old. I thought oh it was God. 16. I thought it he was 16. Is fis- Here's the quote. It's a terrible thing to be nearly 16 and in the wrong species. Oh, God. So he might turn 16 within <laughs> He's a the baby! Book, well, but no, he, he is 15. He, he hit puberty early. He could have a beard. All I'm saying. He could have a beard. Maybe he's, but maybe he's too young. He is considered a child. He will be considered a child until he's dead. So maybe you're not supposed to grow a beard until you reach a certain age. (laughs) He's a baby. Well, his girlfriend, uh, who is young by dwarf years, has a something something rock smasher. She has a beard. Minty. 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 Yeah. Minty. Minty, yeah, Minty Rock Smasher. She does have a beard. Um, and she's 60. So they're supposed to hit puberty about 50. Yeah. Um, he does specifically say, Look, son, you might have wondered why you're not as hairy as everyone else. Dot dot dot. Can Carrot just not grow a beard? I think I think that Carrot can't grow a beard. So, poor Carrot. I think I think I think it's so much funnier, and it's so much more fitting to Carrot's like image. If the dude is just naturally completely beardless, it's so frustrating. I have to always me picture they Carrot never... as being completely clean of, of it, anything. It's so frustrating to me that they yes. never address this in text. I feel like it is very important, and that they should. This is really the true mystery of the book i do think about uh i do think about um whether or not carrot has a beard often yeah it's something that just sort of bounces around in my brain a lot (laughs) yeah yeah same if (laughs) okay um i'd like to note that like all of the covers with carrot on him and this is probably why i think of him as as beard I know they all I he doesn't know. have a beard in any of them he's never they, got a beard he, he doesn't he doesn't um Paul Kim, Carrot is so good I love a beard. Carrot is it Josh Kirby is that the guy the, the other guy no that's some other dude isn't it there are two primary artists oh Jesus anyways the really cluttered cover um, that's my favorite one, and he hasn't got a beard in that one. Yeah, he hasn't got a beard in the comic either. Yeah, yeah. What you got? He could, he could still have a beard. I'm, I'm just saying. It's I don't a think he has a beard. I don't think he should have. It's a, beard. a possibility. I think it's so much it's, funnier if he doesn't. It, it is funny. Uh, it's still weird that he doesn't have a beard. Josh Kirby, that's his fucking name. Josh, Josh Kirby's Kirby. covers, which are my favorite covers. Uh, he doesn't have a beard. Oh. I love Carrot. I do too. He's a fantastic character. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for Men at Arms, which is basically a Carrot novel. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I was about to say, I forgot in this one almost how little he actually appears as it were yeah um, he's he's definitely here and he's definitely like a major character but he's not like for some reason i and remembered him i would say just, he's a like, pretty so much of this book but he's not really he's like and i he's would not... say he's a very pivotal character here absolutely yeah but he's not and he's not it's it's kind of like sam biden's like carrot is carrot he's a staple of the watch and he's not he's not 
the carrot that he will grow to be in this book. And like, oh, he is very much not. Uh, that carrot appears in uh, Men at Arms. Yeah, carrot as we yeah. know him. And like that, and the book itself, so... Men at Arms, does talk about the fact that uh, being an Ink Morpork kind of changed him and made yeah. him who become who he is. Yeah. Um, I, he's just a phenomenal character. I really love Carrot. It is. Um. Also, if there's a person listening to this, he and Vimes all of Josh Kirby's art. Please do so. <laughs> if you take Josh nothing, away, if you take nothing away from this fucking podcast, just go look at Josh Kirby's shit. I love this man so much. Uh huh. And we're assuming that you've already read these books; otherwise, this is going to be completely incomprehensible. Yeah, yeah we just we stopped. Say, yeah, we should say that every time. If you haven't read we this just fucking stopped. book, stopped. Stop. Yeah, we just stopped doing summaries. Like, we did summaries for the first few books, and then we stopped. I was always against doing summaries. Yeah. You can't listen to a two-hour podcast about a book without listening to the goddamn book. Or reading the goddamn I, book. People do. People do. I, I, and, and, and if they do, they've I accepted that. I do. I do that. that sort of thing. And I feel like they've accepted that. Sometimes That's true. I listen to long analyses of video games I am never going to play. But I don't expect them to justify the game. I to do me. that too. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to talk yeah. about it and I'm going to judge it without ever having played or seen it because it's a type of game I'm absolutely not going to touch. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, man. Um, man. So I think I really like how Carrot and Vimes contrast off of each other. And I think for, like, all of the books up until Thud, they are the core of the watch. Mm -hmm. And their sort of dynamic. How sort of Vimes, in a way, is the embodiment of the watch. But, like, Carrot is the trigger. Uh, pardon my mixing my metaphors this way. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Uh... Kind of. I, th so, I think you have to explain that more for me. Yeah, yeah. Go deeper. Okay. So, Carrot, in a way, is kind of the one that makes things happen. Where Vimes is the watch. In the beginning of the novel, Vimes is this drunken disaster of a man. He is an alcoholic. He is hopelessly sad. He can barely function. And he and the watch are more are basically mourning um, a dead comrade. Mm -hmm. And then Carrot comes in. Carrot is fresh. He's super ideal idealistic. He genuinely believes wholeheartedly that the watch is a noble calling mm -hmm. and, an, and that it's an honor to be accepted in the watch. And Carrot's actions are the thing, are what makes things happen. Firstly, he goes and arrests the head of the Thieves Guild in a truly fantastic scene. Like, I cannot stress how how delightful that scene is. Mm -hmm. Or the description of what happened is. Yeah. And then uh, he leads his actions, which is basically, like, trying to arrest everyone inside of the, inside of the, uh, the mended drum, I think it was. Or was it mm -hmm. the... Yeah, the Mended Drum. There are several pubs in this. Uh, basically lead to the Watch realizing that they can do things. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is something that they had forgotten. And getting fucking drunk and wandering into the shades where they first encountered the dragon. Mm -hmm. So uh. Vimes is the Watch, but Carrot is sort of like... The thing that comes and kicks the watch in the ass and makes them do stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, how I saw it, um, basically always, is that Carrot is the ideal of the watch. Carrot is like the mythical idealization of the watch. Where Vimes is what the watch actually is. And what the watch actually has to do. You mm -hmm. know, Carrot doesn't like to get his hands dirty he doesn't want to he doesn't understand or believe in it at this point uh whereas that's all vimes knows because that's 
all he can do to do what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how I've always seen their relationship and what makes their, their interactions so great is how they impact each other to move forward. You know, the longer we go, the dirtier carrot is okay with getting his hands. He'll even lie a little bit. Uh, (laughs) And the farther (laughs) we go, the closer Vimes is to actually living up to that concept, that ideal Mm -hmm. of the watch. Uh, Yeah, that um, sounds, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. uh, I feel like that's all true. Um, It was really bizarre to me that Carrot just like kind of accidentally kills a dude and it's not really, it doesn't really affect him in this book. Cause like that is so true that he's such an ideal, idealistic guy, but they just have this scene where he just straight up like throws a book at a guy and that guy dies. And he's just like, it, that was the right thing, right? That's what I was supposed to do. Well, it was an accident. <laughs> People fall. It was an accident. It was an accident. But um, it is it is very funny to me because it was so it was such a surprise to me just considering Carrick's whole, whole character. Like I just didn't like I've read this book before and I still was surprised by it. I still didn't expect it. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the choice to but that's um, also like I think the 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 choice to have a man kill somebody because they're just following orders and feel nothing about it, and then going into a banality of evil speech was, like, pretty intense. <laughs> but, and, and, oh, yeah, that was a lot. And maybe not philosophically sound, but it, did, it was very funny. Yeah. Yeah. I will also note that Carrot being somebody who, when necessary, can kill somebody quickly and efficiently and without, like, really feeling bad about it, is something that is once is reaffirmed and established in later books as well. Yeah. Is like it? in Men at yeah. Arms. Oh yeah. Carrot can yeah. fucking kill people and does not care. That's that's really funny because Vimes can't. Yeah. Like Vimes I mean Vimes yes. does eventually in the books kill people, but he's it's like a big thing when Vimes does it. Yeah. Uh and just for Carrot it's so casual that I'm- it's it's really funny despite their whole, like, our whole perceptions of them and how they're, portray- like, presented and portrayed. Oh, for me, it that's perfect. Yeah. For, yeah. Me, for me, it fits perfectly because in the ideal- idealization of the watch, they're not normal people anymore. They're soldiers. Mm-hmm. They're at, mm-hmm. at war with all that is evil. And what is evil is what is law, right? That's everything that Carrot is. The law is what is evil. But to, to Vimes and to the watch as it actually exists, what is good and evil is mostly up to what man feels. They are men mm-hmm. doing their best. Not heroes, not soldiers, just people doing their best. They don't want to mm-hmm. kill. They don't necessarily know what's right and wrong all the time. They're yeah. just doing their best. For me, Carrot being... That perfect soldier being able to kill without hesitation <laughs> and without remorse fits perfectly into that. Because I think that very much is the idealization of of the watch of cops. Of, yeah. Yeah. You know, and and that oh idea has become incredibly more potent as time has gone on. Not that there weren't police brutality arguments in 1989. There were many, but um, you know. And reading it again at this specific oh. time in history, uh, I think I think it uh, it is a potent message. That yeah, he may not have intentionally meant that way, but which is very very true. You know, yeah. as as is often true with Terry Pratchett books, even if he did not intend to put this philosophy in there, that he puts so much philosophy in there reveals something about him, our world, ourselves. You know, that is the magic of them because he went to such lengths to write careful humans, real humans, that whether he meant to or not, they stay relevant. And the idea is that he's putting in there, stay relevant. Mm -hmm. 
God, yeah. it, is, it is funny to read these books from a perspective where, like, like I genuinely despise cops. And it is interesting to read these intensely human books about cops. Um, and, like, I feel like, God, I feel like, like, the Night Watch probably was the the closest book to, like, really represent, like, how I feel about cops and how they function. <laughs> um, because that's the point where <laughs> they're closer to reality, I feel like. I feel like, I mean, in these books, Sam Vimes makes the watch function like we imagine that cops should function. And that is not the reality of how cops function. And in Nightwatch, they don't function like Sam Vimes has made them function. Like, I, I don't know if that makes sense. But it is an interesting experience. Yeah, I mean, it's something we're probably going to explore in greater detail as the watch books go on. Sort mm -hmm. of like... And I find the pol the political positions uh, presented by the City Watch books to be very, very interesting. I yeah. don't necessarily agree with them. But I find them compelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. for me, part of why this book works, even though I hate cops, um, is that he's intentionally negating and making fun of those heroic cop ideals. Yeah. Sam Fimes constantly, and this is really fucking funny to me, says action movie lines out of their original context. He does like seven or eight of them in this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed. Did you, this. Did you collect them? I didn't collect them. Oh, well, I, I noticed, noticed it. one of them. There's, there's like, are you feeling lucky, punk? Uh, here's looking at you, kid. Oh, he loves that. Yeah, he does. Um, Terry Pratchett loves that uh, fucking dirty hairy line. Yeah. He's this is like the fifth or sixth time he's used it. In yeah, the, he does. In Discworld. Um, there's another yeah. Clint Eastwood line that he uses. There's like a whole slew of them, right? And they all come from Sam Vimes' mouth, completely out of context. Mostly is him being kind of an idiot, just kind of saying stuff. Yeah. And yeah. you have this this great moment, which is like Sam Vimes turns in his badge. The like pivotal scene in so, so many cop action movies. Give me your badge. Turn in your badge and gun. You're out of here. And then he goes fucking rogue and just starts <laughs> killing people in the traditional movie. But in this... He turns yeah. in his badge and he's like, I'm a thing. Oh, what matters? <laughs> what is true? <laughs> and then he does decide, like, oh, I can go a little bit rogue. But when it comes down to it, he recognizes that's fucking stupid. That's fucking wrong. I'm not here to fucking kill people. I'm no fucking judge. And then he gets put yeah. in jail for it. <laughs> yeah. and it's perfect because he isn't and the only time and and then after that the the time that he fixes that where he actually does do that is when he's with his team again when he is accepted back when he is acting by the book you know within mm -hmm. the limits and cognition of his power like it is it is a lot of this a direct parody of those action movie concepts of that heroic cop I ideal, hadn't even, which I really liked I hadn't, e I hadn't even noticed that like I noticed some of the individual action movie lines but I and I noticed the turn in your badge thing but I had not even I hadn't thought about it that way and that's really funny yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think that even at this god this book just works on so many levels oh yeah yeah and I, I think even at this time, in writing this cop book, he was at least relatively cognizant that cops do bad shit. 
because they think they're powerful, Mm -hmm. because they think they're strong and that they're the only line between order and disorder. Mm -hmm. Sam Vimes feels like that guy, like he expresses some form of that ideal. And then he kicks himself in the fucking teeth for it like a lot of the time (laughs) throughout Mm -hmm. these books. Sam Vimes... Throughout all of the watch books, Sam Vimes often has moments where he's like, that's fucking wrong. That's fucking bullshit. Oh, fuck that. And then he has that power taken away from him. He takes it mm-hmm. away from himself in many aspects. Um, you know, I won't kill. I will not overstep those bounds because nothing is worse. Nothing is more cruel than a member who's meant to protect stepping over that line because they think they're some grand fucking hero. Um, yeah. He's absolutely It's explored disgusted. a lot in Men at Arms. Men at yeah, Arms? And I that... mean, in Thud, in Snuff, in like <laughs> half the fucking watch books. And Sam Vines that idea, directly says it. Yeah, and that di- that is directly said so, like a lot that, uh, that Sam Vines thinks that cops have to be you know, civilians with a badge, basically, they can't be soldiers. Like, that... Like, Sam Vines does say that over and over, that cops cannot be soldiers, or you're fucked. (laughs) (laughs) Like... Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure if we sit down and read these essays, we'll see some greater insight to that. Because, honestly, it would have been literally impossible oh yeah we should do that to not have been introduced to some of these anti-cop sentiments this is a dude who was hanging out with a lot of writers who wrote explicitly about that uh and in no unclear terms i think Yeah. yeah i think that his commitment to the watch and his commitment to the philosophy of the watch is still so appealing to us even after all we have seen uh, yeah. And all we have learned in our life because of that. This is the only fucking right way to write a cop character. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. he writes the fucking line, but he does it. And, they, and they, they have stuck with us and we have found these characters continuously appealing. Because in the end, Sam Vimes is a man. I am He's so... just trying to do the right thing. And mm-hmm. it's hard to hate that. Yeah. I am so excited for us to watch the the watch TV show. Oh, I hate God, you, bud. I'm so not. It's never been made. Um, we can watch. We uh, can watch Hogfather though. Yeah, I have. I think yes. I own Weird Sisters and Hogfather. But you guys promised me at the outside of. You two promised uh-huh. me on the outside of making outside of making this podcast that you would watch the watch with I me will watch the and we would record watch. an episode about it. I will watch we the watch. We will. We will. I'm just not going I'm to be so happy excited. About it. I just it lives like rent it. free in my head. Um, I gotta say, I love the Swamp Dragons. I love oh, how yeah. much care and thought he puts into writing them and the culture surrounding them and how they feel like real animals. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to note this from my perspective. So uh, for anyone who's listening who doesn't, isn't aware, which seems unlikely, because I think I mentioned it. I'm a dog professional. I own a dog training business. That does mean that I interact with a lot of people who are doing exactly what he's parroting, show dogs and show dog Uh breeding. He has gotten this shit so fucking on point that I literally, I stopped the pod, (laughs) I stopped listening to it at some point. I turned to sound, I was like, I think he must have known like a lot. I don't understand. This is so accurate. He's yeah. describing how this how this person has just destroyed their entire life because they're insane for these fucking stupid, <laughs> disgusting little animals. <laughs> <laughs> and he has gotten it so, so on point. I mean, it is a word, like word for word how I would describe some of the people we have met. And it is 
It is insane. <laughs> He's gotten it so right. Every part, there's this moment, the moment that made me stop was, um, there's a description of Lady Sibyl's carriage and how once upon a time, it was probably a very nice carriage, an extremely nice carriage. But in the pursuit of these show, show dragons, in, in the pursuit of this work, it has become absolutely fucking ragged. All of the cushions are fucking gone. <laughs> the fucking paint is peeling. It's just never had any upkeep because it didn't really matter to her. All that mattered was the show dragons and their care and their moving about. And um, I've been in that fucking carriage. I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God, y'all. I've driven that carriage for people. <laughs> uh, that yeah. fucking car that's just absolutely ripped the fuck up. But at least it's big as hell. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, he got it exactly yeah. right. Like all of their lines of dialogue, all of the how they act. Her sitting down and writing this book of like how all of her fucking animals die. Um, yeah, it's really yeah. on point. He did a wonderful job to the extent that he must have done some on the ground research. Maybe his wife's really into show dogs. There's yeah. not a lot about Lynn Pratchett out there in the world. Maybe that's what she likes. Um. Yeah. That, and it also has elements of um. I have an aunt who raises poultry, and I think a lot of the terminology, uh, around the dragons is borrowed from poultry language. Yeah. Like the cobs and the hen. Yeah. And the way that there are special sets of vocabulary word words for basically dragons throughout their entire lifespan yeah maybe he knew and like the descriptions <laughs> and like the descriptions of how like of Sybil's friends from the dragon sanctuary that is like that is like British British horse girl stuff yeah like the tweeds and the boots mm -hmm. and the scarves yeah. And the sort of rich person shabbiness. Yeah, the rich person shabbiness. That is very really British, very horse. Mm hmm. That rich yeah. person shabbiness is a look I, I have seen well. So this certainly has like the weirdest, a very, the weirdest romance we've seen so far inside of any of these books. Like, the best so far, but also the weirdest. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is the most classic, like, why is she going for him? I guess. Yeah. Like, that's fine. If that's what <laughs> makes her happy. We happen to know it works out, but, uh, you know, it's one of those ones where you're like, eh, probably not that dude, right, though? Huh? <laughs> Probably not that one though, right? <laughs> Him? I think. I mean, I, I know think... your family has a thing for men in uniforms, but like that uniform and that man. That man? I think we, we are. I think we are influenced a little bit by the fact that we're all in love with Sybil Ramkin. Um, I do think it does make sense in the text, like what she sees of him. Because she doesn't see him blackout drunk. She never sees him really drunk. Um, she sees him, like, try to be this heroic guy uh, who threatens these guys with a dragon. Like, you know, she, what she sees of him but isn't that's really... after she's already, like, invited him into her house to care for him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that's not the same. He hasn't done that shit yet. She literally instantly is like, damn, you're strong as fuck. Book, huh? <laughs> well, she's also kind of like she also kind of like takes pity on him too. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it, it is the most accurate because I I do feel like it's the kind of relationship where it's like, oh yeah, this woman takes care of a lot of things. She likes to take care of things to feel useful. That's why she loves these like weird broken dragons. So yeah. it makes sense that this strange <laughs> broken man would end up on our doorstep. But also, yeah, that guy really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's that for me. And that's throughout, they do draw explicit. 
they do draw explicit parallels throughout between um between the watch and the dragons, the mm-hmm. little swamp dragons. Mm-hmm. I believe yeah. the term is uh whittlers, mm-hmm. an entire race of whittlers. Yeah. yeah. What's left when you uh <laughs> what's left when you <laughs> um extract everything of use and value? God. Fuck, I love this yeah. book. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. And I really like how Vimes' relationships with relationship with the swamp dragons kind of evolves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where in the beginning he's like kind of freaked out by by them because they're weird, dangerous creatures that smell funny. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> gradually by reading about all of the things that can kill them and all of the horrible ways that they can die, he begins to emphasize, emphasize, <laughs> empathize with them and see himself in them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so God. good. I love it. Vimes and Sybil's <laughs> introduction, like, uh, meet- first meeting was really funny to me. Like, she's just such a... I just love her so much. And and just like any situation, she just grabs it by the teeth. (laughs) And yeah. I mean, Uh. it is to me an evolution of that like woman character. He's been fucking up so many different ways before this. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, she's (laughs) she is in her own regard, incredibly ambitious, almost to the point of insanity. For what she desires. Mm-hmm. Um, it just so happens that that's not like traditional money or power or anything like that. She has those things. She's she's fine. What it is is these fucking dragons. And and this fucking guy. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's that same idea though. That incredibly ambitious um, woman who can do whatever she wants really. But mm-hmm. uh, doesn't because of some internal issue lady sybil really i think she's actually she's also i think she's also got that almost like two flowerish quality to her where she's convinced that where she doesn't really seem to accept that anything bad could possibly happen or that anything could not go her way and so in a way the world kind of bends to her will to the point where she shouts at a fucking major dragon like three fucking times. Yeah. yeah. She's like, no way Same this me. fucker will kill me. It in the nose. This fucking asshole won't kill me. Square up, have- you little bitch. Like, what <laughs> is that? Where she's like, well, if it's anything like the swamp dragons, I can deal with it. Yeah. I know dragons. Yep. So good. Or where God. she manages to scold an angry mob like they're a bunch of little boys. Yeah. So that is just one of Terry Pratchett's favorite concepts. He does that shit all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, I, I like and that. Where she, so um, and where she just like chews out a bunch of attempted muggers in the shades. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. <sighs> all right. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is the librarian's really in this book, and I love him. He doesn't really um, do a lot. He's just very, very funny and sweet, and I love him. Mm-hmm. Um, they also do the time travel via the library space. In a way, he's like... In a way, he is the most relatable character. Because he's just like... Doesn't... He has these things that he likes, and he otherwise does not accept that he is involved with the world in any way. Mm-hmm. Like, as far as he's concerned, like, animal laws don't apply to him, human laws don't apply to him. He's just vibing. Yeah. Yeah. I think The Librarian is one of the early and consistent examples of Terry Pratchett's ability to immerse himself mentally in the philosophy of a different perspective you know i think he does it much better with the golems but the librarian is a wonderful example of this 
He just mm-hmm. doesn't give a shit. Yeah. About almost anything. He's just trying to go forward, get some fucking peanuts, and protect the books. Those are the only things that matter. And the rest of everything kind of isn't important to him. He'll respect yeah. it sometimes. He'll give it some do because he's not a dick. He doesn't desire to be unpleasant. But they just don't matter that much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think Ted yeah. Pratchett writes that incredibly well. And it, and it shows his tidy hand at incorporating other philosophies into his understanding. He can immerse himself in that excellently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, man. We could okay. talk about this book potentially forever, but we should tidy up our final points. And we will talk about it more because we're going to talk about it so much when we talk about the the uh, the watch television show. You're uh, killing me. You're killing me. The watch, the watch episode? Like we were going... The episode where we watch the watch is going to be me saying the cinematography is bad, the audio is bad, and then groaning for 45 continuous minutes. And then we'll How many off. episodes? And I'm going to be going like, uh... Oh, it's like eight hours of content, asshole. Oh, God. It's not... They produced a the whole watch. TV show. I have seen... I have seen, like, three episodes of it, and those three episodes were... Truly astonishing it in is their badness. Exactly eight hours of content. Every episode is sixty minutes. There are eight yep. episodes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And we're gonna be one of the select view who ever fucking watched this fucking show because its original viewers could should have been counted in the thousands, not the millions. That's how fucking bad it is. It finally got released in Britain. How it shouldn't go? have been released. <laughs> oh, uh, it went. Uh, well, let me let me say the kindest thing that I can say about its reception is that it didn't like because its viewer base was so small. The outrage was relatively limited. Let me put it like that. Well, and everything I heard about this indicated that it wasn't, like, the type of thing that devotes real outrage is something that's, like, directly offensive. Whereas everything I heard about this is just that it's incredibly, soul-crushingly low effort and boring. Yeah. They just don't do anything very that's, well. That's... Hmm. That's everything I've heard about I wouldn't it say it's necessarily... That low effort it is actually i think one of the more ambitious terry pratchett adaptations and it's one of the ones that like thought was put into it from what i have seen it's just that the thought that put into it was very low quality i can't believe like, you just well, called well, it one of the most somebody... ambitious adaptations i'm not so sure about that one chief there's no yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, Past it's the first the one. Hogfather? Past Weird Sisters I haven't seen animation? The Hogfather, but... Past all oh, the yeah, radio Oh, yeah, it's definitely shit? more ambitious than The Weird Sisters. The Weird Sisters are fucking yeah. killer. Yeah, I mean... They're incredibly ambitious. Um, the thing is, almost every adaptation, uh, with the exception of uh, Good Omens TV show had a tendency to be extremely loyal to the script, like arguably to a fault or extremely loyal to the books where it'd be almost like see beat by beat, scene by scene loyalty to the text. And there wasn't, um, there wasn't really very few people have tried to take Terry Pratchett's books and make something new out of them. Let me put it that way. Um, and The Watch is one of the few things to try and, like, take one of Terry Pratchett's works and expand on it. 
-hmm. It's just that they did a fucking terrible job of it. Yeah, I know you're saying it like it's a bad thing. It is one of... (laughs) I I don't agree with you that it's a bad thing that the adaptations stick really well because something I got into an argument about the other day. I mean, I think it's kind of a bad thing because most of the Terry Pratchett adaptations I've seen are just like the book, but not as enjoyable as the book. Yes. I haven't seen The Hogfather, so I don't know if that's if i feel the same way about that how have you not seen the hog father i'm really shocked by that just because i, I feel like i would have shown it to you i owned it at some point i watched it many times i've even made you know like i made philip watch it once um i i don't know you actually haven't made me watch that much in in our long, long friendship. It's kind of surprising. Well, I didn't have a um, house for a lot of <laughs> Like, I didn't have, like, a house that was mine. That is true. <laughs> um, uh, for most of it. So but, yeah, I, I do think... I do find there to be something compelling about trying to take something and, like, really adapt it. Yeah. Um, I got into I an do, argument about I just that think that... The other day. Yeah, I just think it's, like, genuinely extraordinary that they managed to so badly misunderstand what the watch is, what's, what it's about, and how it works, and how the characters work. Like, they got everything wrong. <laughs> I don't just mean, like, different, but, like, wrong. Yeah. And it's, like, yeah. genuinely maddening, because there's... An, it's almost like there's a kind of like disrespect to it where yeah. oh, it feels one, one embarrassed second. of its source material. Okay. Any final thoughts on Yeah, we haven't scored this Arts book. Guard. We haven't scored this book. What what are your guys' scores for this book? Wait, let me pull, let me pull up this sheet. Discworld book order. Because that's the whole shebang, ain't it? To fucking argue. To remind us of our communal order. So, We've got Weird Sisters, Pyramids, Light Fantastic, Mort, Equal Rights, Color of Magic, and then Lowest of the Low, The Failure of Failures, Sorcery. Yes. So, I know for me, Guards Guards is under Weird Sisters by a smidge just a little bit uh and i know that chio you said that it was over weird sisters yeah um my instincts when i was first going in were to rank it uh below below weird sisters and then i realized something while re- reading it which was i could basically consume guards guards on an infinite loop like I can finish it and then immediately go and read it again and again and again. And I cannot do that with Weird Sisters. That's true. Um, Weird Sisters is more intense. For, yeah. For, and for me. Has... Well, no, it's not even a matter of intensity. I just like, like it less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It for... feels less perfect to me. Yeah. For mm-hmm. me. There were parts of Weird Sisters where I was like, ugh, this is fucking bullshit. I didn't have a yeah. moment like that in Guards Guards. And and yeah. to me, Guards Guards easily makes the top of this list. You know, I had a, a moment okay. of doubt. But then I remembered anything about McGrath Garlic. Um, oh, yeah. And her relationship with the fool. And I was like, no, this is a better book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. um. Yeah. Okay. Guards, guards goes at top. Guards, guards are new number one. Okay. Oh man, that- I'm having a sneaking suspicion that like the city watch books are going to be very heavily concentrated towards the top of the list. We already we knew this. Yeah, it's literally his. I most mean, we famous, knew it. Like, <laughs> and 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 so defining, and the area where he wrote the most in. They're just like are the most watch books. Out of all of them. That's not true. There are more Rincewind books. <gasps> oh. <laughs> that, hit me in the, that hit me in the gut. 
<laughs> well, the Rune really books exist. are very are going to be like very heavily concentrated towards the bottom of the list. There, Those were there a dream. are more City Watch books. There are eight City Watch books and seven Wizards books. Oh, never mind. Never mind. And Rincewind doesn't appear in uh, at least one of these uh, Wizards books, which makes that one infinitely better than the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Rincewind. Hate this fucking dude. <laughs> yeah. Mm. God. I hate him so much more after sorcery. I hate him so much more every single day. Every single day I hate him a little bit more. God. Just like a, a wee bit more. But yeah, um, the City Watch books are my favorites. You guys also really like them. My actual top favorites are all the godly books. Yeah, they're books, my favorites as well. Are all the, all, all the godly books. Um, Hogfather, Small Gods, uh, Thief of Time, shit like that. Uh, but because they're not your favorite, I think that they will land lower on our communal list. Yeah. They will still land yeah. quite high on my personal I list. Do not... Yeah, I do not like the death books as much as the two of you do. Yeah, yeah I, I I, remember really loving the death books, but it's been a hot minute since I've read them, so we'll see. Yeah, and I think, I just think... But I gotta say, books Reaper Man... Reaper Man is going to rank very high. Well, we're only three books till Reaper Man. Well, so we'll be there soon. Yep. Two or three months or something. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's sign off. Yeah, let's, let's... sign off. It's, it's been been a long recording. Worked hard. I've got like three more hours of homework tonight. Later, skaters. See ya. Oh no. Oh no. Cut cut that from the <laughs> Okay, I'm cutting that from the podcast. I'm not getting caught by the fucking we're, federal government. This is how we got Al Capone. We're not we're not allowed. <laughs> we're not allowed to say that. So I I'll cut that.